Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. My name is Marilyn Shannon, and this is the Breaking Free Show. Thank you so much for being here today. I hope all is well, and I hope you had a great weekend wherever you are. I'm whispering. Oh, okay. I'm not said I'm whispering. I better not whisper. I better use my outside voice. Okay. Everyone, welcome. I'm so glad you took the time to join us today. It's an honor to have you. So, hi, Amnon. Hello. How Everybody are you? needs a director and an Amnon. Oh, uh, well. Yeah. I didn't know I was whispering. How are you? I'm just fine. How about you? I'm good. I'm good. Did you have a good weekend? I had a good weekend. Did you have a good week last week? I had a good week. I had a good weekend. Good. It was all good. I got to see my three-year-old grandson in his first dance recital. He was a bunny, and he was Aww. cute. He was one boy in the sea of, of young, little, cute little girls, so it was very cute. It was fun. All right, so on with our show. Remember, anytime during our show, you get to call in anytime you want to 919-518-9773, And you can also join us on Skype, and that's at computers, that's plural, the number 2K voice, anytime you want. You can also join us in our chat. Just put your name under our video, and you can comment, ask questions, whatever you like there as well. We love it if you would join our show anytime. It's an invitation. So if you are moved by something our guest says today, and you want to comment, ask questions, you're curious about something, please feel free to call in or chat with us in any way you like. So I'm really so excited about my show today because I have been looking for somebody to talk about this forever. And I am so glad we have found Freddie Negretti to join us today. And Freddie is a tattoo artist, but not just any tattoo artist. He specializes in black and white. And you're going to hear Freddie's story. So let's welcome Freddie to our show today. Hey, Freddie. Hey. Welcome. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Great, great. Thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure. So tell everybody about Freddie. Uh, well, you know, I grew up in uh, the Chicano Cholo, uh, East LA barrio scene, and um, uh, got in a lot of trouble down there. But, but still, you know the Chicano Cholo scene, we, we gave the world khakis, Pendletons, uh, lowrider cars, graffiti art, and uh, black and gray tattoos. Uh, that's kind of where I came in. Um, I was uh, born with art ability, of course, and so I became the uh, go-to graffiti guy in the neighborhood. Uh, also, I did hand poke tattoos on my homies, and I used to, you know, love drawing and everything. Uh, we had a, a lot of certain images that were very important to us, uh, like Mexican revolutionary type art, Pancho Villa, Zapata, uh, the Chara girl. We love girls, you know. Uh, <laughs> also, uh, you know, the religious images uh, from the Catholic Church, Jesus and Mary and crosses and roses and rosaries. Um, and writing. Uh, mm-hmm. We were very much into writing, fancy writing, graffiti writing, because uh, we wanted to say something about who we were and where we were from. So you were, in a, you were in a gang, is that right? Y- yes. So how did you, first of all, how did you find your way, or why did you find your way into a gang? I think, you know, uh, part of it, my, my parents were both... Uh, and they were both gang members uh, in the Pachuco scene. And uh, they went to prison when I was really young. And my sister and I went through foster care. We ended up in like a, an abusive foster home, uh, like a white foster home. And, and um, so uh, I had an, uh, kind of an identity crisis. You know, I knew I was Hispanic and, and uh, You know, their thing was, uh, we're going to beat the Mexican out of them. You know, they try to make us good white kids. And um, uh, but when I was about 12 years old, I rebelled and I ran away. And uh, I went and lived with uh, my friends in the Mexican neighborhood. And of course, uh, you know, the very obvious thing to identify myself with was uh, the Chicano gang scene. 
And uh, so I joined a gang really young, uh, just about 12. And I got very much uh, involved with that. I was very, very loyal to this, this subculture. And uh, it affected my life in every way, you know. Um, I ended up being institutionalized uh, because I was a really bad kid. I ended up in juvenile hall and camps. Probably the longest period of time that I would stay out of an institution during my teenage years was like two months, you know. And uh, but I did become a self-taught artist because the whole time I was in there, all I did was draw, and everybody wanted me to draw this and that. And uh, you know, so I did get you know a skill out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, eventually, when I went to prison, I learned to tattoo with a homemade tattoo machine. And uh, when I got out, I set up my little tattoo shop in my apartment, in my kitchen, and I started doing tattoos on all the homies, you know, prison style tattoos. Okay, I want and, you to go into that in a second, but I just want to go back for a minute. So both your parents were part of gangs and your mother, so your father was um, Mexican and your mother was Jewish. Yes, so in, in uh, East LA, Boyle Heights, uh, there was a, a big Jewish community and uh, a lot of Jewish immigrants settled in uh, Boyle Heights. And they had this uneasy relationship with the uh, Hispanic community. They just didn't get along. But probably the biggest thing that the, the Jewish community had a problem with was when the, their daughters would go with the Suave Pachuco guys. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and what, what do you mean by Suave Pachuco guys? What is that? <laughs> Well, the pachucos, you know, the zoot suits, the style of clothing, you know, uh, you know, the, the talk, you know, and their whole subculture is quite appealing, you know, especially to immigrants. Um, even today, Armenian immigrants, uh, Russian immigrants, they take to that Chicano subculture lifestyle, that street style, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, it wasn't any different, not much different for, for the Jews when they settled in East L.A., you know. So mm -hmm. my mother and father were uh, kind of a result of that little historical event that took place there. And, and, um, and they both were members, gang members. And they both went to prison when I was really young. Mm -hmm. Two and a half, actually. Two and a half. And did they stay in prison? Yeah, you know, they both had, uh, you know, pretty rough lives. Uh, I met my mother finally and even went to go live with her when I was 14. Um, I met my father when I was 21. I never had any animosity or anything towards them. Being a gang member myself, I, I was actually kind of pr proud of their, their little heritage, you know. Um, I, I had nothing but forgiveness for my father when I met him. We became really close up until he died just a few years ago. And so uh, we went on to have a really great relationship. And and your mother, so your mother and your father, I, I take it, were not, did not stay together then? No. 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 And your mother, she, so so you, though, associate with being Hispanic, not Jewish. Or do you associate uh, you know, with both? With both. I, I wear my star, David. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, and and um, I really recently was able to get in touch uh, with my Jewish heritage because I went into a, treat, a Jewish treatment center because I was Jewish uh, called Beit Teshuvah. And, uh, and so I learned a, an awful lot about Jewish heritage and customs and religion so you were in there for yourself or you were you were in there because i thought i read somewhere that you actually are kind I of work like, there now you work there now okay yeah well i mean i volunteer there now but i i work with uh young uh heroin addicts and group therapy and one-on-one -on -one therapy interesting before we went live i was talking to freddie about 
you know, the, the paths that we find ourselves kind of plopped on, you know, some things we do, you know, everything obviously is some kind of a choice somewhere along the way. But we find ourselves on these paths that are so crazy winding and kind of absurd in some ways. And yet the magic that comes from these crazy paths are just, you just can't plan it. And Freddie has that magic, comes from crazy paths, but has this magic. And so it's just fascinating to me. So you, you, you start to do tattooing in prison like a kind of a makeshift tattoo thing, right? That you do. That's kind yeah. of common. Actually, actually it was uh, quite sophisticated. And, and because uh, the Chicanos love tattoos, uh, prison is where it really developed, you know, um, starting with the hand poke tattoos, um, you know, which I started with. Uh, some of the older guys would get out of prison and they taught me how to, set up a little hand poking rig, you know, with a guitar. What is, what and, does that mean? Hand poking? I know nothing. Oh, uh, that means that you're doing it by hand basically and, and not motorized. Um, what about the sanitary the, things? Nothing like that. Doesn't matter. Uh, well, with the hand poking, we didn't think much back then about. Yeah, I guess not. <laughs> sanitary, but in prison, however, uh, we did clean the needles and then everybody, uh, you know, like a, a person that wants to get tattooed, you know, uh, has to have their own needle made or uh, or you can make one for them, you know. So we use a different needle on everybody, uh -huh. especially because they need to be sharp. But uh, in, in prison, what they did, you know, with the, uh, the cassette players, because you could have a cassette player and later on a CD you know, a Walkman CD, and uh, we would break the motor out, and it made this little rotary, it had a little rotary post on it, and with a big pen, a toothbrush, electrical tape, a paper clip, and a sharpened guitar string, and a battery pack, we would make a very, quite sophisticated tattoo machine. Uh, the ink we would make, you know, from uh, the ashes, from a burnt chest piece or burning baby oil gives off like a suit, a black suit, and you would, you know, kind of harness it on a on a piece of paper, scrape it off with a with a razor blade, and uh, mix it with water and soap, and you'd have ink. Uh, myself, I ended up in a really uh, um, unique circumstance uh, because you know I started in youth authority, so when I was in youth authority. I got in big trouble in there for selling dope inside there. And uh, I was given three years added to my time in a lockup facility called Tamarack. And this lockup facility was in this old building. And, and it was like uh, just for bad, bad YA kids, you know, the worst of the worst. Uh, so the policy towards us was, look, if you guys don't kill each other, We'll let you tattoo. We'll bring you pornography. We won't search your cells. And so, uh, and we learned how to make those uh, tattoo machines. And every day we just tattooed ourselves all up, you know. <laughs> uh, but that's how I got really good at it. I think uh, things might have been very different if it wasn't for the fact that I was in an institution where they actually let us tattoo or turn a blind eye on it. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, like I said, when I got out and started tattooing out of my apartment, at the very same time, uh, they opened a tattoo shop in East LA on Winter Boulevard. And uh, the guys that opened this shop quickly found out that the people in East LA wanted tattoos, yes, but they didn't want traditional looking tattoos. They wanted their tattoos to look like they were done in prison and uh and they accommodated they they uh learned how to adjust those professional machines uh with a single needle and fine line they didn't have to do any color or anything just black and gray and um and they were doing a great job so when i was tattooing out of my apartment at the same time this shop was tattooing i was seeing all this work people would come and say hey look what i got at this shop 
And so I would send my work, you know, to those guys. And, and uh, eventually we made contact. And uh, Ed Hardy ended up being the owner of that tattoo shop. And he felt, and we got to hire this guy. And no, no tattoo shop anywhere would hire a Chicano Cholo gangster. You know, it's just there were none in the industry at all. And uh, so I was like the first one. So myself, Jack Rudy, Ed Hardy, Mark Mahoney, Bob Roberts, we introduced a new style of tattooing to the professional tattoo world called black and gray realism. It's probably globally the most popular style of tattooing today. So let me ask you something. Is it the black and, and gray that is the prison style or is there something else about it that makes it the prison style? It, it's it's uh, the black and gray style. It just has its origins in California prison. That's where it first started. Uh-huh. And more than likely because in prison, you, we didn't have any colors. Right. You know? <laughs> and most and uh it was a chicano thing colors don't show up that that well on darker skin either but you know um it had it had everything to do with with the the ingredients of our culture our style of dress those images that we loved so much and held fast to and our love of tattoos so, yeah. so, so t- but what is it about your culture that loves all of these things so much? I, I think, uh, you know, part of it is maybe the kind of the dark edge of it, mm-hmm. you know, like, uh, I know when I finally got out and this is in, in the, in the 1970s, right. Um, 1976, when I finally got out. I was covered with tattoos, you know, and this in in the seventies was very rare. So if you saw somebody all covered with tattoos, um, they were either some kind of a sideshow freak, <laughs> or they were a gangster that's been to prison. And so, uh, and if you've been to prison because prison is so tough, and a lot of people don't even survive it, people just naturally had this thing. I, this is a badass. You right, know what I mean? Right, right. This guy is, don't mess with him. But no. people like badasses for some reason, right? Yeah. What, yeah, not, yeah. What is the mystique? I'm not saying that that's why people yeah. get tattooed today, but right. that's kind of what it meant. If they, you know, I, I know like, uh, for instance, I would go to like Disneyland or something and I'd wear a, a you know, a tank top and uh, people would, you know, be standoffish with me, you know, like, whoa, you know, but they would stare at me. You know, I was probably the only person in the whole park that was covered in tattoos, you know, but I knew there was a future in it because the little kids loved it. Uh-huh. Little kids would come up and say, look at the tattoos, look at the tattoo man, you know, and, and, uh, and I'd show them that my tattoos and stuff, you know, and, and uh, back then I realized I was like, you know, there's a good future in tattooing because these kids love it. And these kids are going to be adults one day and they're going to love tattoos. But that I was, was right. You were right. That was smart of you. That was a really insightful thought. So you've been out of prison since 76. So you've been out like 40, what, 42 years? No. How many? Yeah. 76. Uh, but who's counting? I know. That's a long time, though. <laughs> Uh, 42 years. Time. Wow, that's a long time. Yeah. Cool. Uh, but I actually, later on in life, I went back to prison, you know. But we can get into that. <clears throat> we can get into that a little bit later. Okay. Kind of All right. So you um, you did <clears throat> connect. So I just want to go back for a second. You did connect into your Jewish heritage. So now, do you, are you connected to your Jewishness other than that center, like Jewish family too, or...? Um, you know, I, I, I'm connected, you know, through my temple, which is also the recovery center. And, uh, and I, I've built lasting, uh, relationships mm-hmm. with, uh, other, you know, counselors and, and, uh, recovery workers. And, um, uh, 
and a lot of great relationships with uh, people that have gone through the program that, you know, I've helped through. Um, you know, so I stay in touch like that. Um, I have a really strong relationship with God, um, mainly through the 12 step program, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, but I have, you know, other religious background. I mean, I have a degree in biblical literature. Uh, there was a time in my life when I quit tattooing and, and uh, became a born again Christian and went to college and, you know, got that, that degree. So I think I've put it all together into a fascinating walk with God that I have today. So what is your, what is that message that you walk with? Like, what is your, what is your personal kind of mission, movement, identity to yourself? I guess I would, I'm, I'm, I'm curious. Um, you know, if you, I don't know if you know anything about the 12 step program no. that we, that we learn to rely on our higher power. And that's God as you understand him. And I understand God through, you know, Judaism and Christianity. Um, you know, I also believe in Jesus, you know. And, um, uh, but I have respect for all religions. But I think, you know, uh, holding fast to, you know, like a religious dogma can be a stumbling block, you know, because I've found God to be uh, a greater power and a, a spiritual being who uh, wants to come into our life mm -hmm. and wants to be invited in. And uh, you, you'll see him in every aspect of your life, you know, it, it, once you have that openness and that willingness, you know, just to let go and, and let God. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, so, you know, that, that's my thing. And I, I know today, it, it's really tough with all this different religious things, uh, uh, the political issues, uh, because certain, you know, denominations will believe, oh, this is a sin, and it becomes a political issue, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it divides people, and uh, some people are turned off to God completely, you know, and they become atheists or agnostic, and uh, they feel completely opposed to these other people who are claiming to be religious, but have an opposing political view. Right. And I think what that does is uh, dam damage the possibility of having a great relationship with a spiritual being who is our greater power. I mean, you know, for me, I, I believe in science. I love science. I think it's fantastic where we've come, you know, through science. But what science really does to me is point to an extreme greater power. And uh, it helps me with my relationship with God. And I just, I think uh, anybody, whatever uh, their political view is, can have a, a, you know, we're free to believe, you know, we're in a free country and we're free to believe and, and, and uh, to choose how we wanna live and what we wanna believe. And I, I think everybody has that right. And I think that's a God-given right. Mm -hmm. if, if God forced us to believe in him, then we'd be robots. That's right. You know? so I'm really strong on this freedom that we have to choose. And, and I've chosen my path and, uh, and, and it's a good way of life. And I'm willing to help any, anybody else that needs help with it. Mm -hmm. But everybody has their, their free freedom of choice. And it's not absolutely. me to judge. Right. Absolutely. I mean, you just, and I think that's part of your, part of the intrigue of your story is how, I mean, how you have found your choices. And that's important. That's a great message. Right. So you do, I want to show, we have a, we have a PowerPoint, um, some slides that we can show about some of your art. And I'd love to okay. show some of it. So I'm going to ask Amnon, and then you could describe. I mean, this is you at work, right? <laughs> yep, that's me doing a tattoo. <laughs> All right. And, and then the next one. Uh, this, is, uh, this is called uh, Our Lady of Sorrows. And uh, they're, they're everywhere, you know, uh, in, in different Catholic churches. And it's kind of a painted statue 
that uh, that has the Madonna in tears because of the death of her son Jesus. So did you do this? Is so this? There's an actual. Did you look at something to do this, or do you do this? Yes. I, yes. Yes. It's an actual statue uh, called Our Lady of Sorrows. And you did this on somebody's arm. Actually, that is somebody's leg. Somebody's leg. Okay. That's their cap. And it's between two tattoos, so it's kind of like, it's called a, a filler tattoo where you kind of fill in a space. So the complete image is not there, you know, like, uh, you know, her head or, you know what I mean? So you just focus on um, the beauty of her face and and a little bit of back background indicating that she has you know, like a cloak. And how long did it take you to do that? Uh, that that one took about four hours. Four hours. Amazing, right? All right, what's the next one? So this this is a, a back piece, and um, and it's a portrayal of uh, the Archangel Michael uh, destroying the devil. And uh, what I did in here, because there's a lot of traditional images of, of uh, the angel Michael, but so I took a, a different image uh, from uh, this great illustrator who uh, drew, drew uh, Conan the Barbarian. His name was Frank Frazetta. And, and then uh, I added my own take on it and you know, kind of made him with the wings as they put the sword in his hand, you know, uh, put put horn, you know horns on uh, the devils, and uh, so I kind of you know transformed uh, a famous painting to become you know the archangel Michael. So when you when somebody comes to you, they come with an idea. Yes, and then you bring in your originality to it. I mean, how does that yeah. work? What's the process? Yeah, you know, then uh, we discuss the image. Uh, I make suggestions. In this case, he wasn't sure if he, uh, you know, found an image of the Archangel Michael that he was completely happy with. There's a lot of them out there, you know, and and uh, we, as artists, we usually stay true to the known images and statues. Uh, <clears throat> so I... I did a sketch for him uh, like this, showed him uh, the images that I'd be working from, and I suggested it to him. I thought it would be a different take, so he wouldn't have uh, the, like the same Archangel Michael that other people had. It would be completely unique. Mm -hmm. And he was he was up for that. He was. Oh. And that took how long? Uh, it was uh, five five sessions. About thirty hours. Thirty hours. What is the and how was how's the price range for doing something like this? Uh, you know, I charge two hundred dollars an hour. Okay. Gotcha. And what's the most expensive tattoo you've ever done? Um. Well, there's people that I've covered their whole bodies. Yeah, so it just keeps on going then. Yeah. <laughs> gotcha. All right. I, I've had customers, uh, you know, I had this guy from uh, that came from Hong Kong and uh, and got a complete chest and and sleeve done within three days of being there, you know. Uh, so... Normally, you know, you do a portion, let it heal, and do another portion. So, I mean, we got the whole thing done in, in three days. And he was a rock. He just sat there. It hurts, so, right? It bleeds. It hurts. Yeah, not, not a lot of blood. No. Try not to go too deep. You try to keep the tattoo in the skin layers. Mm -hmm. You know, you have seven layers of skin. I think uh, when you break through the layers and into the flesh is when you draw more blood, you know. So my, there's not a lot of blood with uh, my tattooing. There is some seeping. 
So are you noticing a trend today with a theme that people want tattooed? I, you know, there's a, a lot of themes, you know. Uh, what I noticed when, when uh, I was tattooing in East L.A. and tattooing mostly all gangsters and cholos and cholas, you know, um, you know, those images... I found that those images that were important to us and uh, the reasons behind them, like memorial tattoos and writing and, and titles of songs and things like that have become, are really important to people from every walk and every culture. And, um, and they're discovering that they can say something about themselves through some image of a tattoo something that they love, a poem that they love, um, sayings, one-liners, you know, uh, portraits of loved ones, you know, and so a lot of the classic Chicano art, people just want to get it, you know, like the clown girl and the smile now, cry later, things like that. It must be amazing for you, I'm guessing, to be able to get that close to someone not just touching their body, but that's one thing, but to hear, you know, why they want something on their body that they're going to carry, but, you know, pretty much for the rest of their lives, something that touches them. It's as close. It's, it's like t touching their heart when you, when you, when you do a tattoo on somebody's body. Right. And I really try, you know, my, my thing is this, you know, like uh, most, most art and artists are trying to do their art. You know what I mean? Uh, what I'm trying to do is the person's art. You know, this person wants some artwork on their body and they want it to mean a certain thing. You know, tattoos are very meaningful these days, you know. And, um, and so I'm just the practitioner, you know. Mm -hmm. But I try to find out what's in their head what are they thinking? Maybe I can help them with the image. Maybe I can transform the image to make it more evident of what they're trying to say with it. So I really try to, that's, that's my art. Mm -hmm. It's trying to find out what this person wants to say with the tattoo and um, what it means to them. So besides the fact that you have this extraordinary ability to kind of paint, in a way, how much of who you are and from where you've come from and the idea of being able to make choices and, you know, how expressive you are just by nature, how much of all of that has made you into this great tattoo artist? Uh, you know, a, a lot of it, you know, um, but especially that experience as a youth being a rebellious youth, being in a gang, almost not surviving it, um, you know, and just uh, in the last 10 years, um, having a new outlook on my life, uh, being sober and focused has added a new dimension to, to my artwork. You know, like um, I'm, you know, 61 years old and I'm doing, I'm supposed to be on a downward, you know. Oh, please don't tell me that. I'm 64. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what I mean? Yeah. But I'm on an upward one. I'm developing as an artist. I'm getting better. Um, this newfound life that I have has made me a more focused artist and, and, um, I'm doing the best work that I've ever done in my whole life right now. And what's making it, I mean, what is it about the art and, and how is the art better? I mean, it's pretty extraordinary, but is it more detail? What is it? Well, you know, there's a lot of different things. There's been, uh, you know, a lot of technical advances, mm -hmm. but a lot of it is this, you know, um, you know, when, when I was a young tattoo artist, when we were first starting this, one of the things that set us apart from the rest of the tattoo artists doing traditional tattoos is uh, we had 
greater art ability. Um, back then in the 70s, if you were a, if you had great art ability, you weren't going to tattoo because the traditional style of tattooing was very simple, mm -hmm. uh, just kind of like with bold lines and colored in, almost like cartoonish, you right. know? Um, so probably what's changing tattooing the most is the fact that with kind of the dis destruction, so to speak, of graphic design and illustration, uh, these great artists that have the ability of like a Leonardo da Vinci or Michelangelo all over the world have chosen their medium, have chosen tattooing as their medium mm -hmm. because it's still a pure art and it's a unique art. You know, you can't do it with computers, you know, right. you got to do it. You got to do it. I mean? Yes. And, yeah. and so uh, with all these fantastic artists bringing new insight into the industry, everybody learns from it. All the artists everywhere absorb from it. With social media, I can see what artists in Australia and Europe, probably some of the most fantastic artists come from the Ukraine and, and, uh, and Eastern Europe. And uh, it's just unbelievable the work that they do. And it's inspiring for everybody. So interesting. So you know, I can see, wow. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's so fascinating. It's pushing You're pushing the envelope. Yeah. Uh -huh. that's, so that's the biggest thing is, is uh, you know, there's a lot of technology improvement with the inks, uh, needle setups, machines. You know, what's uh, fascinating is that that little rotary machine that we invented in prison has become, you know, uh, manufacturers, tattooers and manufacturers have figured out a way to uh, create a rotary style professional tattoo machine. And I would say all the young artists today, that's their go to machine. It's and it was it was invented in prison. Interesting. OK, so first of all, I want to ask you what on your body as far as a tattoo, what is one the one tattoo on your body that you just love or do you love them all? You know, I love them all, you know, because. Uh, all my tattoos were a part of a journey, but probably the one I love the most is uh, this one on my nest that's neck. It says, uh, oh, Look. yeah, <laughs> there, there it goes. goes. Uh, rest in peace, Frosty. And, and uh, uh -huh. Frosty was the nickname of my youngest son who passed away. And, um, I was actually in prison when I did that tattoo. And so, um, what happened with him? Um, you know, he, he was, uh, shot and uh, murdered in a kind of a gang incident here in Los Angeles. And uh, it, 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 it brought the worst, you know, part of worst time in my life, the darkest times, uh, because, you know, um, I feel a lot of guilt because of it. You know, you know, his mother and I were divorced. I was living in Los Angeles. She was living in, in uh, Central Coast, California, beautiful place. He wanted to come and live with me and uh, we had a custody battle and I got custody of him and I brought him to Los Angeles and frankly, I wasn't all that good of a dad. And, um, and he started running around the streets and eventually got shot and killed. So, uh, and I became uh, just a complete hopeless drug addict. It was a really dark time in my life. I am sorry. Well, you know, uh, on a bright note, you know, it it also destroyed, you know, the years of drug abuse, you know, kind of destroyed my health. I, I was diagnosed with congestive heart failure, drug induced congestive heart failure. And um, and, you know, actually, I ended up uh, in the county jail. Um, sick, you know withdrawing um you know i uh i nearly died in there i had three heart attacks 
And um, that's when I had my spiritual awakening with God. Um, I remember, you know, a story about a, a king, a prophet who went to a king and told him, uh, look, your days are numbered. You're going to you're going to die. Get your affairs in order, basically. And uh, the king went to God himself and asked for more time. And God gave him 15 more years. And I was inspired by that story. And, um, you know, I, I prayed to God. I didn't. I said, God, I, I'm not going to make any promises because every promise I've ever made, I've, I've broken. All I'm asking is for a little bit more time. So I won't die in this wretched county jail of failure uh, so I can have a chance to redeem myself and be an example to my son who's still alive. And uh, actually, I made a miraculous recovery from that. Um, and I, I believe that God touched my body and, and brought healing to my body and made a way for me to go into this treatment center, this Jewish treatment center where um, I was introduced to a complete new way of life. And, and um, it's been 10 years now that I've been sober and clean and uh, on this journey of sobriety and uh, relationship with God. Um, I've had therapy, you know, the, everything that the, that program offered worked for me. I was able to uh, deal, deal with my son's death. Um, come to terms with my part in it and, and, um, you know, accept my, my part in it and, um, and have this outlook that I have now that everything I do, I'm, I'm doing as if my son was uh, watching down on me and, uh, I'm going to live my life in a way that would make him proud, you know? So that's how I live my life. Well, that is, um, no there are no words beyond words. I, I really appreciate what you just shared beyond anything I can say. It, it, and it just makes me want to read your book all the more. And here it is. And I think, I think you, everybody should read this book because the whole story is in this book, right? The whole story, yep. the whole the story. Whole and, and that's and some. and some and and see this is the point that you are the epitome of the breaking free show you are the epitome of what my books in just one afternoon are all about you know my series in just one afternoon anything is possible and everything is possible anything and everything is possible it, it, it it's all possible there's nothing that's not possible so tell us, tell us about this book, Smile Now, Cry Later, Guns, Gangs, and Tattoos, My Life in Black and Gray. Can you just sum it up? Uh, well, you know, uh, when people ask, you know, wh wh why did you think uh, your stories in why did you write a book, basically? Um, so the book has, you know, um, that Chicano culture, uh, the culture that gave people low-rent cars and all that graffiti. and and there's a great interest in that. And uh, I was very much uh, a part of that and have uh, firsthand knowledge of it all. Uh, also the prison life, uh, people are very interested these days on what goes on in prison. Uh, so I have a lot to say about that in the book. And uh, then there's the tattoo thing. Um, it's kind of the historical aspect of tattooing, how it actually got to where it is today. And uh, then, of course, uh, most importantly, it's uh, a book of redemption and new life and how a person can can be as far to the curb as you can get and uh, still find hope and power to uh, rise up and uh, live a new life, a victorious life. Victorious. And it's not too late. It's never too late. It's never too late. So I just want to remind everybody out there, it's not too late to call in. It's not too late to comment, to just say hello, 919-518-9773 or computers. That's plural 2K voice on Skype. And you're more than welcome to join us in our chat. So Freddie, 
you've done movies, you've done celebrities, right? Yeah, we'll see. So um, in uh, <clears throat> the early 1990s, um, I was approached by uh, this producer, director, uh, Taylor Hackford, who uh, was working on this movie, Blood In, Blood Out, about uh, the Chicano aspect and, and prison and everything. A, a great, amazing story, amazing movie. And uh, so he came to me and said, hey, I, I hear you're the guy to talk to when it comes to prison tattoos. And he needed tattoos for his movie. And um, actually I went on to work on that film for six months, uh, every aspect of the art of it. I helped develop a, a technique to apply these temporary tattoos and um, eventually, in the course of that movie, I was connected with uh, the world-renowned makeup artist, Freddie Blau, who makes all the blood. And he was the first one to do the tattoo process for movies like uh, Tattoo with Bruce Dern and, and um, The Illustrated Man. And uh, so we worked together on Blood In, Blood Out. And I helped him. You know, I had printing experience and things like that. So... Together, we kind of per perfected his, uh, his technique of doing uh, temporary tattoos for actors in movies. And uh, so we became partners. And for the next 15 years, I, I worked on countless features and TV shows uh, because with the increased popularity of tattooing at that time, you know, of course, uh, the media is going to want to use it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think tattooing is a great thing to use uh, in developing a character uh, for a movie, especially these days, you know, uh, where tattooing is so popular, everybody's getting them. You know, like before, it was just how you describe somebody that was uh, from prison or something. Uh, nowadays, uh, you can use tattoos and tattoo imagery to really help develop the character that that is uh, being portrayed in the movie. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so I helped uh, kind of pioneer that as well, the so, temporary so, tattoos for movies. So are you the tattoo artist of the stars? Uh, you know, <laughs> I, I've done my fair share of stars, uh -huh. uh, but there there are bigger names than my, my own uh, with tattooing stars, you know, uh, like Mark Mahoney, you know. Um, but yeah, I've, I've tattooed a lot of celebrities and sports figures and things like that, mm -hmm. you know. But I'm I'm more happy with uh, the work I did, you know, for for film, you know, things like Austin Power and Powers, uh, the Blade trilogy, you know, Con Air, Falling Down, Rising Sun, you know, things like that. Yeah, it goes on and on and on. On and on and on and on. Well, let's go back to showing some of those PowerPoints because they are really important um, in what we're doing. But also, I want to remind everybody, please feel free to call in. Don't forget. Okay. So we've already, is this the one we already did? Oh, no. No, this, this is one. Okay. One. Tell us about this. So, uh, you know, one of the things, uh, so when we did uh, religious style tattooing, you know, when uh, back in the 70s, um, we just had kind of almost, you know, the images were off, a lot of them off of like funeral cards from from Catholic churches, you know. Um, and as, uh, you know, we got the internet and everything, we were able to see a lot more, especially in the statue work, you know, um, from the great masters, like Michelangelo and, and uh, Bernini. You know, and and um, it became almost a tattoo style in itself. People loved the statue work. This one happens to be um, uh, Neptune hmm. and or Poseidon, either one. And uh, it was uh, done by Bernini. Do you and, take, you know, Freddie, do you take art classes in general, like uh, from the ma about the masters? And do you do uh, that? You know, I when I was in college, I, I got a a degree in uh in in art mm -hmm. in graphic design and illustration mm -hmm. you know but um you know not anymore but you learn an awful lot when you're you know reproducing a, that comes from a 3d image you know 
And so, you know, uh, it really makes the image that you're tattooing look a little more th 3D mm -hmm. because it's coming from a, a sculpted image. How so, many degrees do you have? Uh, I have a degree in, in uh, biblical literature. I have a master's in apocalyptic literature. And then I have an art degree. Goodness gracious, Freddie. A bachelor's in art. Goodness gracious. All right. And what is this one? Well, this is uh, actually the, the, the client's hand. And, uh, you know, holding a, a, a ro the rosary beads. And uh, so I just, I put some beads on his hand. You know, I kind of modeled it and took a picture of it. You know, the, the dove, of course, represents uh, the Holy Spirit. And um, the whole tattoo is his devotion to spirituality and prayer. This is one of our clown girls that, that, that I talked about, you know, that um, became a very, you know, popular design with uh, the Chicanos. You know, I don't know why, but we loved, and I remember doing it when I was a, a kid, you know, just making our girls, drawing our girls uh, like with a clown face, you know? And so I, I mess around, usually, uh, you see the thing going around her eye? Yeah. Uh, that's usually just like a, a rectangle, you know, shape. And there's sometimes one on the bottom, too. And uh, so I, I try to mix it up and make it different, mm -hmm. you know, by just using one and not on both eyes. And uh, giving it almost more of like a, a floral shape, you know, just... Just to change it up a little bit, make it different. What kind of tattoos are women asking for? Oh, they're getting all kinds of women. We tattoo more women than men, actually. Maybe not me, but at 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 the shop, you know, the other artists uh, doing smaller tattoos. Um. So, you know, there's they love the geometrical stuff. They love uh, the the sacred geometry. Women love that stuff, mandalas, um, writing, you know, little sayings, um, floral designs. Uh, floral designs were more popular back in the day. I think, I think what you're seeing as more popular with women these days is just the geometric stuff. Mm -hmm. I can understand that. What is this? Uh, so here you have a classic uh, Chicano themed tattoo because on the right you have uh, like revolutionary soldiers, but they're women. We like to make our revolutionary soldiers women. And you see them there about to ambush. Why some, is that? I got to interrupt. Why is that? Why women? I think because we just love beautiful women. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> Good answer. Oh, we were gangsters. We didn't want to tattoo a bunch of men on ourselves, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so so I I want to ask you, so is it women of all ages, first of all, that that is the trend, or is it younger women or women of all ages? All ages. All ages. And you see so many mothers and daughters coming in together. Really? You know. It's amazing how many mothers and daughters, you know, it's like, uh, and, and they'll get not so much matching tattoos, but, you know, tattoos that have something to do with their relationship. Uh, this is another uh, Aztec themed tattoo because we were very much into Aztec art, artwork. This is a, an eagle warrior. Uh, the eagle warriors with the, with the uh, Aztec were an elite fighting you know, like they were like the Navy SEALs of the Aztec army. And uh, they wore, wore helmets like that, that depicted, you know, a Jaguar. And they wore like suits, spotted suits also, so that they looked like Jaguars, you know. Mm. So, uh, this is, that was my creation. Let me ask there's, you. There's some, Ganesh. I got to ask you this one, Co. I've been wanting to ask this question to somebody forever. What happens as you age? 
when you wrinkle. With the tattoos? Yes. Oh, you know, with black and gray tattoos, they actually look better. They get softer and smoother, you know, and mm. I think if they're if they're originally done right, they age really, really well. Um, of course, as you get really old, you know, they look a little bit blurry, more blurry, you know, but by that time, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> who's, lo who's looking? <laughs> All right. And this was. Uh, that's Ganesh, the uh, Hindu, the Hindu God. Um, and uh, this this guy is he's half uh, Indian and and half uh, European. So on one arm he did all like Catholic images, you know, like of Jesus and Mary and statues, even some Greek statues. Mm -hmm. And on the other arm we're doing um, all Hindu type statues and images the detail is just extraordinary uh this is a wraparound of a sleeve um this is more aztec art uh you see on the on the far right is the uh aztec god of love and dance and flowers and uh uh his name is Xochipili, or her name and uh in the middle is the uh, Aztec sun god. And then on the left is uh, another depiction of a jaguar elite. Before you go to this one, just tell me, what's next for you? Is there something next for you? Um, yeah, I would like to see uh, a portion of the story in my book be a movie, you know, and uh, uh, and so there's a lot of different people reading the book right now that could make that a possibility. Um, but I think that's going to be the next thing that I try to focus on. Mm. So, okay, so the book is on Amazon, right? Yes. Okay, and what? And so, just in our, we just might have a moment or two. How would you? What, what would you like to tell our audience about any about coming to you for a tattoo, anything? Well, you know, um, I have a website uh, with uh, a, a section in there on a lot of uh, my recovery story uh, where I go more in depth in there. It's uh, uh, freddynegretti.com. And um, I'm on Instagram as freddy underscore negretti. And I'm Facebook, Freddie Negretti. And uh, if you want to get tattooed, then you just call Shamrock Social Club in West Hollywood. Uh, the number there is 310-271-9664. And uh, they'll have some questions for you, and they'll schedule an appointment and put you in touch with me. And, and what is your, like, final words of wisdom? You know, it, it's that theme, never give up. Uh, there's always hope. Um, there's always new life, you know? And um, I would advise everybody to open their heart and open their mind to the reality of, of God. And uh, God without religion, just your own spiritual walk. God will come to you as you are. Uh, who you are and where you're at and um give it a try mm -hmm. and i just bet i bet when you if not just looking back but if you were looking forward from when you were 15 16 18 you probably could not have imagined being able to have accomplished all that you've been able to accomplish no <laughs> that's what makes you no, such, right right no 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 uh, I I remember as a as a youth I I was pretty certain that uh, I would probably spend the rest of my life in prison. Mm -hmm. um, and it's funny because so many of my friends, the people I associated with, the people that I met in institutions, uh, 
you know, went that, that route. Um, and so it could have been a very easy path for me to go on, you know, it could have a very thin line there for me being in prison for the rest of my life or dead and, uh, quite the opposite. Right. Uh, being a successful artist, <laughs> a successful, successful artist, successful businessman, successful spiritual counselor. It's, it's so important for somebody with your message to be out there. And I want to thank you very much for being here. Yeah, thank you. It's been a thank pleasure. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. And thank you everyone out there for being here with us today and sharing in this, this story that you're going to see one day on the screen. And you're going to say, ah. Uh, I know, Freddie. So, <laughs> Freddie, thank you once again. Okay, thank you. Bye, and we'll see everybody next week. Bye. You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. If you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archives section at nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Telestream's Wirecast Software, StreamingGear.com, Carolina Apparel, and DeltaForce.net.